A lot has changed since I last spoke here in early January. Not only my pandemic beard, but the pandemic itself. Not only my job and my plans, but all of our plans and ways of life. My wife Ruth has work in the Episcopal Church around strategic change, all of it outside of Colorado. And when I announced in January that I would leave the ACLU of Colorado in March, I expected to go with her to a new place this summer. Instead, all the plans we were working on were swept away when the pandemic hit. We figured out that we could stay in our home for another year, with both of our young adult sons back in their rooms, working and going to school remotely. We found it quite wonderful to all be together again, except for the few occasions when it's not. Here at First Unitarian, I will continue to serve as a community minister on the Faith in Action Council this year, while I'm also now serving as a consulting minister for Two Rivers Unitarian Universalist in Carbondale over the next year. I have no idea how our lives will unfold after that. But we know we are fortunate to be where we are in such a time of challenge and change. COVID-19 is no joke. And I don't understand all the talk about reopening when the spread of the virus is so much worse around our nation now than it was when the lockdown began in March. A new challenge emerged after the police killing of George Floyd to figure out how to take part in protests against racism and white supremacy during a pandemic. Meanwhile, the impact of the virus has revealed so clearly the already existing racial and economic divides in our nation. Three times more children are going hungry in our nation now than during the Great Recession. And our failures to build robust health care and child care systems are quite evident. The start of the school year is becoming a matter of great anxiety. Even voting is a greater challenge in a year when it matters as much as ever. Although we are lucky in Colorado to have mail-in ballots for all of our elections. In spite of everything, though, there is hope to be found in these days. The pandemic causes us to stop and think, to halt mindless consumption, to question some of our assumptions. Maybe we don't need to fly and drive so much just to have meetings and talk. Virtual General Assembly just had the third highest participation ever. Maybe we could do it that way again sometime, even when we don't have to. At least for a while, the pandemic has done more to lower carbon emissions and give the environment a break than most formal environmental policies. I'm not sure if it's part of a bigger pattern, but I've never seen so many birds in our own backyard, <laughs> and it's a wonder to watch them. People are eating less meat and wasting less food, even as our supply chains struggle to adjust to the new reality. If the coronavirus is like the earth crying out, stop. We have a chance right now to listen and to learn. The pandemic won't let us ignore people who are so often made invisible. People in prisons or detention centers or meatpacking plants or homeless shelters. We see that our lives and fates were connected all along. In the working world, there are those of us who simply can't shelter at home, and we have learned who the essential workers really were all along. I've never been so grateful for medical staff and delivery workers and garbage collectors. I can only hope that we remember to keep seeking a more just economy for everyone, even when the pandemic is over. Now, as awful as our national politics may be, as worried as I am about federal forces in Portland and federal inaction on the coronavirus, I'm beginning to have cautious hope, even in the political arena, as we approach November. The very fact that things are so bad may open the door for hope in the future. As a minister, I won't tell you who to vote for, but I certainly can encourage you to vote, and it's pretty obvious that this is a critical year. I learned about the UU the Vote project at General Assembly, and please remember that there are ways for us to take part in that project from our own homes if we choose. And in the meantime, I have to say that something different is happening around anti-racism too. 
While we have a long way to go, we are seeing changes and hope for change that I haven't seen before. I worked 19 years ago to change the state flag in Mississippi, and our efforts failed, but now it is happening. Black Lives Matter tried without success to change the name of the neighborhood I live in, which was named for a Klansman, but it looks like it's going to happen now. Even the owner of the Washington football team is relenting. I'm currently working on a nationwide effort to remove the constitutional exception allowing slavery and involuntary servitude as a punishment for crime, just as we did here in Colorado in 2018, and I'm pleased it is gaining momentum in multiple states. We may still be lacking in any kind of national police reform, but here in Colorado we passed some pretty good initial legislation on that front. Perhaps most significantly, people are having conversations about racism and white supremacy culture that go beyond what we typically hear. We are doing that with our proposed new covenant here at First Unitarian, as Mike described so well last week. I heard it at General Assembly, too, where the Commission on Institutional Change has recommendations on anti-racism for our congregations. Which brings me to another commission I listened to at General Assembly. The Article II Commission is beginning a process of reviewing our Unitarian Universalist principles and sources, with any proposed changes to be offered in 2022. I hope we will all engage with that process and take it seriously. The principles and sources have always meant a lot to me, since the first time I attended a Unitarian Universalist congregation was the week before the first version was adopted in 1985. But it is a living document that should reflect evolving understanding of ourselves and of our faith. I would expect that a new version will reflect a greater emphasis on love and inclusiveness and covenantal community beyond individualism naming our own faith history, reflecting the value of all life, and including the proposed eighth principle around dismantling racism and oppression and building multicultural wholeness. In the meantime, there's a lot of grounding for our faith in the version we have now. Our theme for this month is the sources, and we don't always pay as much attention to the sources of our faith as we do the principles. The statement includes six sources, one that was added after the initial version. I won't read all of it, but they include direct experience of mystery and wonder, prophetic voices, wisdom from world religions, and references to the golden rule, humanist teachings, and earth-centered traditions. If we really turn to all the sources we have available to us, there's a lot of hope to be found, even for a time such as now. There have been prophetic voices in our past, and it is time to listen to the prophetic voices of today. Love is not only a source of kindness and ethical living, but also a source of transformative power, as our statement of sources reminds us. We could use some wisdom and reason in these times, and we can also use a reminder of the value of wonder and spirit harmony and appreciation for nature and the cycles of life on this earth. The climate crisis will not be gone even when the pandemic is, so I hope we will lift up a vision in our community around climate action as well. If you haven't in a while, go read our UU Principles and Sources again, with special attention to the sources, and ask how they might inform you and help give you avenues for hope even in these times. If any of the words don't speak to you as they're written, or if there's anything you would want to add or change, this is the right time to reflect on that as well. Ours is a living tradition, and where there is life, there is hope. One thing that gives me hope in this year is that our situation practically forces us to take a different perspective and to reflect in new ways. In a way, it makes all of our relationships more intentional. I've actually reconnected with people I might not have pre-pandemic. I'm having conversations with my family unlike any we have had before. There are conversations we can have with each other, even when we are not physically in the same space. 
How do we uproot white supremacy culture and form inclusive community? How can we save our planet and create a just economy? How do we support change in a deeply divided nation while leading with love, still being kind, having a sense of humor and some humility too? There is so much to explore together, so much to learn, so much to give us hope that better times are possible. Wherever I may go a year from now, I am glad to be here now. These are not easy times, but we have each other. And if nothing else gives me hope, that does. May we make it so.